There's a pretty one, Ulysses. There it is. I am delighted to welcome back for her second appearance on Bite Size Book Chats, Adiba from London. Adiba, welcome back. Thank you. Thank you for having me back. Oh, it's great to have you. And we are here to talk about a, a very serious but a very important book. And I'm really glad that you're here to tell us about it. It is called Black Box by Shiori Ito, translated from the Japanese by Alison Markin Powell. Yeah. Tell us about yes. it. So this has been published this year by Tilted Axis Press as a small independent publisher, which I'm, I subscribed to them at the start of the year. And it's been absolutely brilliant because sad to say, I don't think I would have heard of this book or picked it up myself because I didn't know really, I don't know very much about Japanese and um, the Me Too movement there. So when it came to me and I read it, I was like, this is a great and very important book. Right. So a little bit of background um, Shioro Ito is a Japanese journalist and she's quite different I think because she tells us she starts the book talking about what motivates her why she's a journalist and that's very important to her she wants you to get to know her before she starts this book what her dreams are and what kind of child she was and what kind of woman she became and she's such an independent motivated very strong woman. She went away as a teenager to live in America. She, she she really pushed herself and pushed the boundaries because she wanted to be an incredible journalist. And she couldn't be a journalist in America. I think there were some visa issues. She, she comes back to Japan. During her time in America, she met a man, Noriyuki Yamaguchi, who is quite a powerful, high-ranking journalist. So just for reference, he wrote the biography for Shinto Abe. Are we the Shinzo Abe? Yeah. Um, so, and it was, you know, it, he was, he's, he's prominent. And he was a friend of Shinzo Abe, the former prime minister. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so he was a high. friend of Shinto Abe as well. So yeah. as a young journalist to kind of have the audience of such a high ranking journalist, it was an incredibly big deal. And he was, you know, very kind and very open to her at the start. You know, he reached out to her and said, you know, when, when I'm in Japan, we should talk. We should talk about your career. And she thought, this is it. This is what I've been working for. This is what I've been pushing for. This is incredible. He comes to Japan. That's when, you know, everything happens. He, They go to a work dinner and she's, you know, it's a, it's a very professional dinner. It's a working dinner. And she becomes incredibly, incredibly drunk. Um, wakes up the next morning in his hotel room. Doesn't have a lot of memory of what's happened that she has been physically and sexually assaulted quite badly. And it's kind of moving from there. It's, it, it, it's about the lead up to the sexual assault and the obviously the emotional, physical em impact of the sexual assault, the kind of confusion. Ito is very strongly convinced that she was drugged. She's not a heavy drinker. She knows that she wouldn't have drank so much on such an important work dinner. It's moving on from obviously the, the individual impact of that, the shame that comes with that, the kind of confusion and distress. But also it becomes kind of a story of her delving very deep into how one can get justice in Japan in what's known as a quasi-rape. And this is quite a new concept to me. And this is really what Black Box is about. It's about quasi-rapes. I don't know whether... What who what is the what does quasi rape mean and who's defining that? This is it very interesting. So this is it, it it is something I think specific to Japan. I don't know whether it's still the case now, but it was. This was back in 2014, 2015. It's when sexual intercourse happens, when the person cannot consent because they are drunk or under the influence of drugs, or they are unable to resist. It's just ridiculous. It's rape. Yeah. It's rape is rape. <laughs> yeah, that's that's kind of what is quite shocking. By calling it quasi rape, it's almost a few tears under a real rape. But because she was drunk, she can't remember what happened. They were in a room by themselves in this hotel room. 
seen as this, this almost different crime that is Less incredibly right. hard to prove. The investigator right from the start is like, hard case. This is hard to investigate. It's written in a very journalistic style, which you'd expect from a journalist. It's not just talking about her own experiences. It goes beyond being a memoir of, of um, being a victim to sexual assault. It, it, it starts investigating and interrogating why. Why has this happened to me? And why is it so difficult to convict Mr. Yamaguchi? Well, certainly uh, Japan is an incredibly misogynist society and the, just, the, the justice system here is just ridiculous. Mm. So this case, her pursuing this case doggedly is what mm. really started the Me Too movement in Japan. So very important. Yes, it took her kind of a year. Well, actually, what I got from this book really is about how many times she was re-traumatized. Yeah. She, there was not that many female police officers. So she was mainly dealing with male police officers who didn't really understand. Or yeah. it was kind of a situation where it's like, well, why were you alone in a hotel room? Then there's political interference. There's strongly yeah. suggested political interference. This was the year that Shinto Abe's biography was coming out. And obviously to have the author be entangled in this is not a good look. So he ended up not being convicted. She tried going to the media. A lot of them refused to publish the story. Yeah. She then staged a very public announcement, which I, I think really upset a lot of people in her family. Towards the end of the book, I was quite sad to read her sister doesn't talk to her anymore because of the publicity that it brought to the family. Um, Every, everything about what she did in response yeah. to this rape goes against so many strictures about Japanese culture. So she's really has done things that are really challenging to Japanese society. So she is my, I didn't know very many details about this story, but just based on doing, you know, a few minutes of prep to talk to you and hearing you talk about the book, she's my new hero. She's amazing. And it's, it's not even just in the context of Japanese society. I think it would be difficult for, for most people to go through what she did so doggedly. So I'd recommend it anyone yeah. read it well sounds uh, like i say fascinating and uh, very important so adiba thank yes. you for telling us about it you're welcome thank you for having i am delighted to welcome to my channel christy jordan fenton she is a writer from british columbia canada northern bc and i'm going to tell the story of how we quote unquote met in a in a moment but first of all welcome christy oh thank you for having me so here's the story. Uh, one of my early episodes, I think it might have been episode three, I'm not sure now, of Bite Size Book Chats. I had Lara from Newfoundland on, and she told me about this book, which is, I'm going to, with my microphone where it is, it doesn't show up very well. So I'm just going to hold it up for a moment and then put the GIF up. It is called Fatty Legs, A True Story, and it was co-authored by Christy Jordan Fenton with her late mother-in-law, Margaret Uliman Pokiak Fenton. And this is the 10th anniversary edition. And so all of the promo material about that episode in which books were discussed went out on social media. And somehow or other, Christy found out about it and tweeted about it and I said great would you like to be a guest someday and so here we are Christy why don't you start by telling us a little bit about um, Fatty Legs. My children's grandmother Margaret Uluman Pokiak Fenton um, behind me here and uh-huh. um, so she was an Inavalak woman from the Inavaluit in the high western arctic and when she was eight years old she wanted nothing more in the world than to learn how to read which led her on a journey to going to a faraway residential school where she was, she was treated pretty badly. And when she was there, she found a way to sort of um, one up the nuns and uh, came up with a very clever way to, to stop the humiliation that she was enduring when she was there. So when she told me that story, I, I don't know how I managed to convince her, but I convinced her that we needed to write it in, in a book. And so that's how Fatty Legs was born. And um, from there, we went on to do four books. So we did um, Fatty Legs, A Stranger at Home, which talked about when she went back again, not being able to speak the same language as her mother anymore. She had lost her traditional language and her journey to fit back in. 
And then we did When I Was Eight, which takes place at the same time as Fatty Legs, but some different stories in it. And uh, Not My Girl, which takes place at the same time as A Stranger at Home, but with different stories in it. That is fantastic. And uh, sadly, um, your mother-in-law passed away a year ago. Uh, this, yeah, this past April. This past April. And I understand from something somebody told me that she was delighted with the 10th anniversary edition, which came out just before. And, uh, mm-hmm. and uh, fantastic. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, you are here to talk about a very different book today. And it's a book that, so my story on this book and why uh, Christy gave me a list of books she'd read recently that she was interested in talking about. And I picked one and, the, and I picked this one because it's a book that I bought, I think when it first came out and I never read it. And then I got rid of it when I kind of liquidated my library when I left Vancouver to move to Tokyo a dozen years ago. And I'd kind of forgotten all about it. A Disappearing Moon Cafe by Sky Lee. Tell me what I missed. I put it on the list of books that I gave to you because I really loved it, but I was also secretly hoping this wasn't the one that I had to review. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> This debut novel from Sky Lee, um, the, I, I love the novel. The reason I didn't so much want to review it is it's been compared to 100 Years of Solitude. Wow. So it's that very epic, multi-generational, it takes place over four generations type of book, a very complicated um, interweaving of families. So it's, it's a little bit difficult to summarize. But basically, the story starts um, in the early 1800s when uh, at a time when 17,000 Chinese people, were, workers were brought over to build the railway in the West. And, and as this happened, as the story progresses, it gets into the time of when a head tax was put on Chinese people. So that meant that it would cost two years of their wages to be able to pay for a single family member to come over. So there's all these men stuck here who couldn't bring their families or spouse over. And then, of course, there was the Chinese Exclusion Act, and there was a time where nobody could come over. So it kind of creates this pressure cooker going on in Canada, which Sky Lee explores, where we've got this very contained sort of tightened society within Vancouver, Chinese society. And then at the same time, the cultural norms, which were very rigid and not very adaptable to to the times of what was going on. So um, in this context over the generations, it plays out in a lot of ways where people aren't given very much of a choice. The men make some some sort of uh, poor choices just because there isn't enough flexibility within the culture or within the society because of the systemic issues. The women make even probably, I don't know if you could say worse choices, but they they didn't have, have much options. And so this plays out into these intergenerational consequences and so there's there's incest and infidelity and substance abuse and and lateral violence and suicide but through all of that is actually still a really really beautiful story the dialogue is really rich and colorful and the the characters are memorable it's kind of a a train wreck of of a of a book all these things and you can see how the dominoes are going to fall through the generations as it's going on it is woven in a non-linear way so you're kind of getting these hints as to what's what's going on but it doesn't feel like this horrible train wreck it's actually pieced together in a really genius way i will say at the beginning of the book they have a family tree but i would recommend not reading the family tree it's full oh. of spoilers <laughs> so oh okay take notes as you go along if you have trouble keeping track of who the people are you're better off to just just keep notes that was a brilliant you know, a brilliant introduction you pretty much gave the full book review and i didn't need oh. to ask <laughs> any questions that's fantastic other than tell us about the title and because i believe that the the family at least for certain generations centered around this cafe Yeah, there's a Disappearing Moon Cafe, and that is a place where a lot of the choices that have the heavy consequences get made. One of the couples, um, and we'll get into all the family names, it gets really complex, but one of the, the choices that gets made is where the male heir of the family is not able to have a child with his wife, and so he then consummates with a waitress, which leads his um, actual legal wife 
to then make some other, I don't want to give away too much, but Mm-mm. to make some choices Mm-mm. of her own, but it, and it all centers around either um, those people who like own the disappearing cafe or work at it. Um, so that is a huge part of uh-huh. the setting of, of the story. I love the way that you're handling spoilers. It's perfect. So what can you tell us about the author? Sky Lee. Um, Sky Lee. She's the founder of the Asian Canadian um, Writers Workshop. Yeah. Um, feminist, lesbian author. So this, where that would tie into or be relevant maybe to the Disappearing Moon Cafe is that even though some of the choices and some of the male story is told it's very female centric and the only character in the book who gets to speak first person to you about what's going on is actually a female and so that would be Kay and she is born in 1950 I think or early 1950s and she's the only one who speaks in first person I think that I'm just speculating I think it was probably done kind of to signify that women, and especially maybe within this particular community, they weren't really having much of a voice until the generation that Kay came along and she's speaking to us from the 1980s. So I thought it was very cool how how that was done, subtle, but very interesting. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I note that Sky Lee was born in 1952. So yeah, maybe an autobiographical character. Do you have any suspicions or any information about how autobiographical this family saga might be? I'm not sure that it's autobiographical, but I think it's probably a compilation or like a conglomerate of hearing, growing up, hearing stories of this happened to this person and that, and, you know, the family's whispering about like, for example, incest is something that's really prominent in the story, um, not intentional incest, but I imagine when you've got this very contained community where people have difficulty coming, bringing anybody new over and they don't have the money to leave, that things might've been, might've happened experiences like the um, Chinese race riots and the impact of the head tax, the Chinese exclusion act. I imagine she would have grown up hearing about what those impacts were. And then maybe using K born around the same time as a vehicle to show her the perspective of how she felt about growing up in that in that cultural reality. As I listen to you talk about how heavily racism played a role in this novel and certainly in the reality of the Chinese Canadian experience, it just makes me think that Canada has really been quite creative in all the ways it was such a horrifically and continues in many ways to be such a horrifically racist place. Oh, yes. Yes, very much so. What originally drew me to reading this book is I had read, maybe it was like a summary or I'm not sure where it talked about. So there is an intersection, which I was interested in, an intersection with Chinese and Indigenous culture. Uh And I have quite an interest in Indigenous culture and literature. That's something we don't hear a lot about in in Canadian history is the massive intersection that happened between Chinese and indigenous mm-hmm. cultures. Um, no, I've never heard of this. Please oh, tell yes. us. It's in the Van- especially the Vancouver area. Intermarrying um, has been a huge thing. Uh, Chinese food is considered sort of the second traditional food for indigenous peoples because uh, when we had the pass system and people weren't allowed to leave the uh, reserve without a pass when they would get to town nobody wanted to serve them but uh, the Chinese restaurants were understood what it felt like to have all these systemic um, measures and oppressions put on them so they always welcomed indigenous people to the restaurants and so as you imagine when men when it would take two years of their wage to bring somebody over to marry there was like all all these Chinese bachelors left in western Canada Mm. and they weren't able to marry white women. So a lot of them um, would intermarry with the indigenous, with indigenous women. So wow. there is, there is a bit of intersection in the very beginning of the book with the indigenous mm-hmm. culture. Mm-hmm. And that's what originally drew uh, me to it. But back mm-hmm. to the point, yes, Canada, very racist. So I think that's what originally drew me to it was that these two very oppressed cultures that I knew that in the, in the beginning of the book, at least that there was going to be an intersection of that. That is so interesting. This is absolutely fantastic, Christy. I hope that I can have you back. I would love that. 
Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much. This is a special treat. I have a new guest on Bite Size Book Chats, Raymond from Maryland. Welcome, Raymond. Thank you for having me. It's great to have you here. And I just happened upon Raymond's Instagram and all of his stuff will be linked in the show notes. And he reads a lot of widely read in many areas, but I think he would agree that his specialty is Black history or Black nonfiction. And so we're going to talk about one of those books. But before we even get into that, I would like Raymond to tell us all about his book club that is partly on Goodreads, but extends beyond book reads. So please give us your elevator pitch for that, Raymond. Sure. So I'm, I'm a part of a book club called Black Men Read that was started in I think about 2016, 2017, but I only got involved recently in the last year of 2020. And so I am one of the book club admins specifically for the Goodreads chapter. Okay. So we have uh, about four, close to 50 members and we pick a book every month to read and have a discussion and we do other giveaways, things of that nature. It, it is a book club for Black men. Right, correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Well, that, and not just in America, all over the world, because oh. we have members in the UK, uh, Africa. I think we may have had a member that was in Japan. Wow, that's fantastic. Yeah. We were at the uh, middle of November. So, what's your November pick? November. Uh, this month's pick is The Prophets by Robert Jones Jr. that came out January of this year. Yes, I read um, it soon thereafter. Okay. Oh, yeah. And I, so, see you, I see you liked it. I did. I yeah, did. Yeah, great. And, and I don't read a lot of fiction, so it was a, a good way to dive back, dive into that again. And do you know what your December pick will be? December is the the new sixteen nineteen project book that came out on Tuesday. Yeah. So with the blue cover. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. great. Well, I went snooping around your Goodreads and found out that you last summer, you read a book that I bought last summer, but I haven't gotten to yet. And I wasn't sure if you'd be wanting to talk about a book you read all that time ago, but you were game and I'm happy about that. This is a really interesting and important book. It is called Down Along with That Devil's Bones, A Reckoning with Monuments, Memory and the Legacy of White Supremacy by Connor Town O'Neill. Please tell us about it, Raymond. Sure. So O'Neill is, a, I think he was a reporter. He was involved with this podcast that was called White Lies. It was about a, the 1965 murder of James Reeve, who was a preacher, white preacher who went down to Selma to advocate for voting rights for African-Americans. And he was killed. And they talk about that mystery of his killing. And so, very, and I actually heard that podcast before I read the book. So, right. yeah. So he was involved with that. But the book is about his investigations of Nathan Bedford Forrest, who was a Confederate general, notable Confederate general during the Civil War, and who, after the Civil War, became one of the founding members and the Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan, which is. It, for viewers that don't know, it's a racist organization. Um, put it mildly. Yeah, put it mildly, right? Ugh. So, yeah. And so, Forrest, it was very interesting. One of the things I didn't know that much about was that uh, Forrest is considered to be the true Confederate compared to Robert E. Lee. He talks a little bit about this in the book because Forrest was more of a working class, you know, kind of person that the every man could kind of uh, uh, see themselves in, whereas Robert E. Lee was a little bit more sophisticated. Oh, okay. kind of, um, you know, he went to the best schools, West Point and all that stuff, and Bedford Forrest kind of stayed in his, you know, his state. Anyway, the book is about Connor O'Neill investigating a couple of monuments that Nathan Bedford Forrest are, that they have out there of him in four different cities, Selma, Alabama, Murfreesboro, Tennessee, Nashville, Tennessee, and Memphis, Tennessee. Some of those monuments were statues. Some were just like buildings with his name on it. Yeah. And so he goes and investigates why these buildings, why these statues or monuments were put up. And usually there was a debate about whether they should be taken down. Yeah. 
the monument issue, I'm sure it's been a big issue in parts of the States, particularly in the South, for quite some time. But the first time that it ever made international news was after the the Dylan Roof yeah. massacre. Then what was the name of the governor there that she took down the flag yeah. in front of the legislature? Yeah, Nikki Haley. Nikki Haley. Yeah, she really, I really liked her for about 10 minutes then. <laughs> And then every day she has a different position on Trump recently. So yeah, I've kind of given up on her. But that was the first time it kind of came into my consciousness. And then Mm -hmm. during the Trump years, it just blew up. So this uh, book, I wanted to read it. You're making me want to read it even more. Does he express his own opinion in this book about Mm -hmm. what he thinks should happen with these monuments? I'll put it this way. The way way I read it, he kind of, he gives everybody their point of view, right? You know, the Opposed people that were supporting these monuments to come down and people who were opposed, right? But it's also sort of a reckoning of this issue with himself. So there's a little bit of memoir in here, too. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And he's a, we should say, he is a white journalist. Yeah. Uh-huh. That's right. from the, and from the uh, Northeast United okay. States, Massachusetts, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And he talks a lot about how because he was from the North, he did think he was particularly, or his his family or anything like that was particularly implicated in, you know, racism because it was all in the South, according to, or how he was taught about yeah. things. Yeah. That's convenient <laughs> myth, right? <laughs> yeah. Does he take on the argument that you get from the right, which is, it's history. You can't, you shouldn't destroy history. Does he answer back that facile uh, argument? Yeah, I think for that, he uses the voices of the protesters, you know, either side, that's kind of how he uses or presents those arguments. You'll have an argument say, yeah, this is just history. Why should we get rid of this? I remember there was this quote from uh, one of the people he interviewed. It was a historian who was from Selma. Austin Fitz is the person's name. Uh-huh. And they said, to help me understand what it was like to live in Selma was to ask me to imagine what it would be like to be reminded every year on your birthday of the worst thing you've ever done. Yeah. Powerful. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, you always hear this other, you know, the argument on the pro side is for, if you're a, a black person in these areas, you know, you see it every day and it's a symbol. It is kind of a symbol saying to you, you don't, we don't want you here, right? right. Um, and, and and I think the other argument that he uses a lot is that when he did the investigation of when and how these monuments were put up, generally we would think it was immediately after the Civil War, right? And it's, it was never the case. Well, some popped up then, but the vast majority of them. Much popped. more recent, yeah. Yeah, yeah, like 1920s. Yeah. Uh, 30s in some cases. And then there was always an underlying reason why they were, you know, there was some racial tension going on. So Miami got put up. I think that the one example he used in Selma was that, I don't know if it was the 1970s maybe, but a mayor, the mayor of Selma was a black man, the first black mayor of the town. Statue gets put up, you know. Yeah, it's, 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 off, it's like, often that kind of a, uh, yeah. a back backlash. Yeah. yeah. This sounds fascinating. You have made me want to read it all the more, and I think I'm probably going to read it for Black History Month next February. So Nice. Yeah. Raymond, you're an excellent guest. I hope that you will come back. Definitely, definitely. Thank you for having me. I am delighted to welcome back Nancy from the Detroit area and the creator of the illustrious book blog, The Literate (laughs) Quilter. Welcome back, Nancy. Thank you, Sean. It's so good to be back with you today. It's a delight. And you, I think you might've gotten up a little bit early for me. So I really appreciate that. What time is it in the Detroit area? It's 8.30 in the morning. So I didn't I didn't get up early. I just had to get ready early. To get, Being get... retired, I can take my time in the morning and do a lot of reading before I worry about starting the day. Well, I appreciate the you fitting me in. It's 9.30 p.m. here on Tuesday night. So, yes. 
Um, you read such a wide variety of books, Nancy. So last time we were talking about an environmental kind of history or a nonfiction book about the Great Lakes. And now we're going to be talking about a novel, a new release this year, Assembly by Natasha Brown, which is a British novel written by a Black British author and a novella, really, 112 pages. Yeah. And you really liked it, didn't you? Yes, I did. It's a book that you can read in one sitting. And because it's told in a kind of stream of consciousness, you can really get into this character. And it's really a devastating book. Natasha Brown has written, this is her first novel. She's written a book that lets you see through this character what it's like to be a person of color, a woman of color in contemporary Britain with roots in a homeland that was a colony, a former colony. Is that Being, former colony named or not? I believe it's Jamaica. I see. Uh -huh. I believe her parents were from Jamaica. She has been told all her life that she has to work twice as hard and she has to succeed. And she does that. She's at the pinnacle of her career. She's making loads of money. She is a um, public face for the, her bank of success. And she's desperately unhappy. And she has a boyfriend who I'm, uh, it wasn't explicitly stated I didn't see, but I, I'm guessing that he's a white British guy. He is. Her boyfriend is white. He is old money, deep roots in Britain, very proper. And the family accepts her, but she feels like this is a status symbol of, oh, we're so liberal, we're so progressive, we're so, and, and we even love this girl. And she's not sure she belongs in this world. As a matter of fact, she's not happy in this world at all. She always feels like an outsider. And there's good reason for that. As, as the day goes on and you hear her talk about what's happening, she faces sexism. She faces harassment. She is accused of having rose up through the company because she is a person of color, not because she earned it. People resent her for having accomplished so much. She sees signs around Britain, you know, go back to your home, you know, the racism, the anti-colonial. Is it set during the Brexit era? Probably. I, I, she doesn't determine exactly what's going on right. at, at time. Because I think everything like that got amped up. It was obviously there before, but it has been kind of heightened during the Brexit and post-Brexit. I think you just used the phrase stream of consciousness. Is that how you would describe yes. it? Yeah. Um, she goes maybe for the weekend with her boyfriend back to the family. Is that the main yes. event? Well, th it, it, that's what it works up to is, is visiting her fa his family in the country mansion. It begins with her addressing an assembly of young women, probably women of color, trying to inspire them to do what she did. And that's the assembly that this is named for. As the, as the day goes on, she's, she knows she's going to be going to this garden party at the boyfriend's family. But she's also dealing with another issue that she has kept from him. Uh -huh. He has breast cancer, comes quite early in the novel. And it's oh, oh. one of the things that she is dealing with okay. throughout the novel is what she's going to do. So, yes, she's got a lot on her plate. She has a lot on her plate. In your review, which I'm going to link to in the show notes, you have quoted two things from the, no the novella that I'd like to read. The first quote that you feature is, be the best, work harder, work smarter, exceed every expectation, but also be invisible, imperceptible. Don't make anyone uncomfortable. So the first two sentences there sound like they could have come right out of the speech I'm imagining she gave to the assembly, but the other, the rest, the other, the last two are kind of more the, the, the darker side of that. Yeah. And then the second quote, is just one sentence, which is quite chilling and powerful. Why endure my own dehumanization? Yeah, that those two sentences sum up the novel of yeah. what she's dealing with. 
and where she's at. I can't wait to read this, Nancy. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. You have a good day.